This video is a walkthrough of answering an exam question. The only way how to learn how to answer questions is by actually answering questions. It doesn't work to just passively absorb the ideas, you have to do it yourself. So as I go through this question, I'm going to put in breaks where I say, now pause the video, and you should go and work out your own answer with pen and paper. Then you can resume and see how your answer compares to mine. You'll need the question in front of you. Click on the link underneath this video and it will take you to the question PDF. So let's get started. Here's the question. First thing to do when looking at a question, skim read it and look for keywords and figure out what section of the notes it's talking about. Here, these are the keywords I spot. Markov chain, state space diagram, stationary distribution. It's obviously something to do with section 10.2 about Markov chains and section 11.1 .1 about stationary distributions. I also highlighted this extra one, 10.3, that was calculations with Markov chains. And one of the calculations we did was based on hitting probabilities. And this expression here, a probability zero at one state, one in some other state, that was exactly the same setup that we had for our calculation of hitting probabilities. So that's worth highlighting also. Next, look for question words. What do we actually have to do? Draw a state space diagram, show some formula, explain our reasoning, write out equations, explain what is meant by, and show that pi is a stationary distribution. We have to invent a Markov chain, we have to do some probability calculations, we have to write down the stationarity equations. Next, think through the course and ask yourself what topics are relevant. Obviously, this is a question about Markov chain calculations, so it's worth just reminding ourselves what are the key steps, what are the key ideas in Markov chain calculations. They are memorylessness and resetting the clock. OK, let's get started. Part A. Divide a Markov chain to represent the state of the game and draw the state space. Dot, dot, dot. Then it gives us some hints. It should have a state MT, a state TT, state HHH. This is obviously a question about encapsulating history in the state. We looked at that in lecture notes where we looked at Markov's example of a trigram generation of text. So this is a question linked to that section of notes. Well, let's just get started. The rules say how much history we need to keep with us and the hints give us a pretty, pretty clear guide. The rules say if I get three heads in a row, I win. If I get two tails in a row, I lose. So I need to keep enough history to be able to represent these two possibilities. Well, let's just get started. Here's the starting state where I haven't thrown anything yet. Now, see if you can fill in the rest of it from here. Ask yourself, what state would I be in after one more throw? I'll just draw on the next two states. Either the next throws are heads or a tails. Then after that, again, either there's a head or a tail. Now it gets a bit more interesting. Looking at this bottom state, tails, tails, that's the state where I've lost. And the question tells us what to do there. A state TT to represent lost with a single outgoing transition back to that state. So we'll draw that on. And then if we think about what we've just done, obviously we should do the same for heads, heads, heads. If we're in state heads, heads, and we throw another heads, then we have entered the win state and we get stuck there. Then it's just a matter of drawing on all the extra transitions. This isn't a complete state space diagram because for a state space diagram, we should draw on all the transition probabilities. We're told two of them. We're told that there's a single transition from TT back to itself. So that has to have probability one, likewise HHH. And all the other transitions, if we just look at every single state has two transitions out of it, they're equally likely. So all of those other edges have probability a half. Let's just check we've answered the question. It gives us the hint. The state space diagram should have eight states and count up how many we've got here. We've got eight, good. 
Part B. I wish to compute the probability of winning. Let rho subscript x be the probability that I will win starting from state x. This is just a question about hitting probabilities. The probability of winning is the probability of hitting state HHH. So it's all entirely book work. This is the sort of derivation which you should memorize from lecture notes and be able to reproduce without thinking. Let's go through the steps. Start out by defining the Markov chain we're interested in. Let, let xn be the state that we're in at time step n. We're told the hitting probability from those two states, the state where we've lost and the state where we've won. And then for any other state x, we need to write down this formula, rho x, the probability that we eventually hit the terminal state given the starting point x. As I said, this is all book work. You ought to be able to reproduce the entire argument from memory. First thing we'll do, we'll condition on x1 using the law of total probability. This is pretty much always the way that any Markov chain calculation goes. We condition on a transition and then we can use the memoryless property and then we reset the clock. We say the probability that we win given that we're in state y at time one, that's exactly the same as the probability we win if we're in state y at time zero because it doesn't matter what time we start counting. Let's just substitute in, we've got rho y, the probability of, of hitting HHH starting from y. We've got PXY, the transition matrix. Question asks us for a suitable matrix P, which you should define. I'm just going to write out P as the transition matrix, the state space diagram from the previous part. It's not clear whether the examiners want us to write out the matrix in full or whether something like this is good enough. In fact, the next part, write out a set of equations that basically needs us to write out all the entries in P. The examiners will give us the marks whether we put out the full transition matrix in our answer to B or in our answer to C. This explain your reasoning carefully. For every step of the algebra here, I've stated what property I'm using. Next, part C, write out the set of equations that could be solved to find row sub empty. You do not need to solve them. I've just copied out here what we know. We know the state space diagram. We know the hitting probability from those two interesting states. And we know a general formula for the hitting probability for all the other states x. So we just need to write out these equations. The hitting probability, the property that we win starting from state empty, we condition on what our first step is. Either we go to state H or we go to state T. We ask, what's the probability of making that transition? And then if we make that transition, what's the property that we win after having gotten there? So if you can fill in the rest. I'm just going to write out exactly the same sorts of equations for all the other states. In these equations, I've simplified a bit. I haven't included rho HHH because I know it's equal to one. I haven't included rho sub TT because I know it's equal to zero. Question says, you do not need to solve them. In fact, they're very easy to solve. Um, I'd start with the bottom line and solve for rho TH, rho HT, rho HH, the bottom line has three equations in three unknowns. And then I can just substitute my answer back in to get answers for the second row. And then that gives me an answer for the first row. Part D, explain what is meant by a stationary distribution. This is pure book work. You ought to know the definition off by heart. A stationary distribution is a probability distribution over the state space such that if we pick our initial state from distribution pi, then the state we're in at time step one will also have distribution pi.
Part E. Here's a pi that's given to us, and we're told, show that pi is a stationary distribution for your Markov chain. It's a bit tricky to actually think through what we're meant to do here. Are we meant to go ahead and solve the standard equations for stationarity to try and derive this formula here? No, there's no point. We're told the formula. All we're asked to do is verify that this given formula is a stationary distribution. In other words, this is a question in which we'll have to use the definition of stationarity. We'll have to say, suppose, we're in, suppose that x0 is drawn from this given distribution, prove that x1 will also have that distribution. Stop and think and see if you can figure out how we would prove that this given pi is indeed a stationary distribution. I'd simply use the definition of stationarity as we did in lectures in section 11.1. .1. Let's suppose that x0 is drawn from distribution pi and let's ask what's the distribution of x1? We use the normal sort of conditioning trick we get an equation for the distribution of x1 in terms of matrix times the pi vector. We need to verify that the given pi is indeed a stationary distribution. In other words, we need to verify that if we plug the given vector pi into the right-hand side, then what we get out on the left-hand side is indeed equal to pi. So let's just go ahead and do this for each different possible value of little x. If x is the empty state of the Markov chain, what do we get? Pi sub empty is equal to zero. And if I sum over all other states y, transition probability from y to empty times pi sub y, well, there's no transitions which take us from any other state back to empty. So all of the p's are equal to zero. So the right hand side is equal to zero. We've decided our formula here for the distribution of x1 evaluates to zero and pi sub empty is equal to zero. So we've proven, proven what we need to do for this particular state. Next, let's look at these five states here. Tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, and heads, heads. So if you can apply similar reasoning. For any one of these five states, the formula we're given in the question has pi x equal to zero. And if I evaluate this expression that we derived earlier, sum of y pi y p y x is equal to zero because none of the states with positive pi y head back to state x. So in other words, either pi sub y is equal to zero or p sub y x is equal to zero. So therefore the sum is zero. For state x equals tt, same sort of argument. The stationary distribution says pi x is equal to lambda for this state. And when I evaluate the right hand side, I get the answer one times lambda. There's only one state which contributes anything. So the equation is satisfied here. Similarly, for the final state, heads, heads, heads. The only thing worth mentioning here, the question says lambda is in the range 0 to 1. Why does that even matter? Well, simply, if lambda is outside that range, then one or other of these two is not a valid probability. So we wouldn't even have a probability distribution in the first place. We've proven that pi is the stationary distribution. OK, let's go back and review the question as a whole. After answering it all, it's worth rereading the whole question and wondering, is there a theme to the whole question? I would guess that the theme the examiner has in mind here, this is one possibility. We know about stationary distributions. We know a theorem which says if the state space is finite and irreducible, then the Markov chain has a unique stationary distribution. That's a standard result. What's going on here, though, is that our state space isn't irreducible. Irreducible, remember, it means you can get from any state to any other. But here, once you get in the win state, you're stuck there. Once you get into the lose state, you're stuck there. And so the theorem doesn't apply. But what we've proved, in fact, is that there is a whole family of stationary distributions. That's what part E proved. The family is indexed by this parameter lambda. 
The other thing that's worth pulling out is the link between part B and part E. In part B, we were looking at hitting probabilities. We we're looking at what are the end states we might hit and what's the probability of reaching each of them. And in part E, it's given us a param parametric family of stationary distributions. And if we look at the type of these stationary distributions, it's actually a linear combination of features, one feature for each of the two possible absorbing states. So that's an interesting link between parts of the Markov chain where you can get stuck and the space of all possible stationary distributions. And finally, I'll always say this, reread the question, make sure you've answered every single one of the parts. For state TT, a similar sort of argument, the stationary distribution for X 